I mentioned before, there's lots of different ways of calculating delta H for a reaction. So we've seen a few already. Uh, another way is using uh, the bond energies, bond energies of all the substances involved in the reaction. So it says the delta H for a reaction may be estimated by using the average bond energies of the reactants and products. Take a look on page 564. So we're given uh, bond energies for, first of all, table 15. Uh, two, we have some single bonds. And then uh, in table 15.3, we have comparison of single to double and triple. Um, we talked about this before. Bond energy uh, is related to bond order. Um, also, bond energy depends on the size of the bonded atoms. Uh, so you can see that there with those values in the table. So those are the tables we're going to use to calculate uh, delta H for a reaction. You may have noticed that all of the values are positive. That's because these values are per mole of the bonds that are being broken. Um, so it says the values in the table are not exact because the actual bond energies vary from compound to compound, so these are just uh, averages. Uh, do keep in mind that energy is released when bonds form, and energy is required when bonds are broken. So again, these are just the energy required to break those bonds. Uh, energy re released will be the same magnitude, but uh, our sign would be negative. Take a look on the next page of figure 15.5. Again, we've talked about this before. Uh, whether a process uh, nets, requires, or releases energy depends on the difference between the total energy required and the total energy released. So if more energy is required to break the bonds between the reactants than is released when the new bonds form between atoms to form the products, then the reaction will be endothermic. The opposite is true, where more energy is released when the bonds form between atoms to make the products than is required to break the bonds between the atoms of the reactants, then the reaction will be exothermic. So again, energy required to break bonds between reactants, and we have new bonds being formed uh, in our products. So here we have, um, we're calculating heat of formation of HBr, and so you start off with hydrogen molecule and bromine molecule. So you got to break the hydrogen bond, or sorry, break, not the hydrogen bond, but break the bond between the hydrogen atoms. That requires energy, looks like 436 kilojoules per mole. And then you need to break the bond between the bromine atoms. That requires 193 kilojoules per mole. And then we have new bonds formed between hydrogen and bromine, two of them. So we always want to be mindful of the number of bonds. So each HBr bond that forms releases 700, actually no, half of 732, whatever that is. So uh, in the table, that's 366, it looks like. So two of those bonds forming releases a total of 732. So we get a net release in energy of 103 kilojoules. All right, take a look at the example at the bottom of the page. It says use bond energies in the table to estimate the heat of reaction for that particular reaction. All right, so what we need to do is we need to know how many of each type of bond there is in our reactants in our product. So I skipped something, sorry about that. To calculate the heat of reaction using bond energies, uh, we're going to take the sum of the bond energies of the reactants. Notice this time it's reactants minus products, minus sum of the bond energies of the products. Or I guess we could say um, bonds broken minus bonds formed. That, that works as well. So bond energy of the reactants minus bond energy of the products. So let's take a look at our reactants. So we have a nitrogen molecule, just one of them that has a triple bond. We have three hydrogen molecules. And so we have three HH single bonds. And then in our product, if we take a look at the Lewis structure for ammonia, our product, oops, we have in each molecule one NH bond. So we have three NH, whoops, three NH bonds per molecule. Two molecules form, so a total of six NH bonds. We got three hydrogen hydrogen bonds and one nitrogen 
nitrogen triple bond. So using the values in the book, we got 945 for the nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. Each hydrogen-hydrogen bond is 436. There's three of those. Minus six times a nitrogen-hydrogen bond, which is 391 kilojoules each. And we get a net change of negative 93 kilojoules per mole. All right, let's go to 597. Practice problem number 49. And so, again, kind of the same thing. Uh, let's not do letter A because it's exactly the same as the, uh, the book question there. So just do B and C. Uh, draw Lewis structures. See how many of each bond there is in the reactants, how many of each bond there is in the products. Take the bond energies of the reactants minus bond energies of the products, and you'll get your answer. So go ahead and do B and C. Go ahead and pause the video now, please. All right, so take a look at letter B. In the reactants, we have one methane molecule, so that's four CH single bonds. One chlorine molecule, so that's one CLCL bond. So add those up. And in the products, we have three CH bonds in the chloromethane molecule one CCL bond, and then in the hydrogen chloride molecule, we have one HCL bond. Uh, reactants minus products, we end up with negative 116 kilojoules per mole. Letter C, reactants, one CO triple bond, two HO single bonds, and then in the products, we have two CO double bonds and one HH single bond, and delta H for the reaction is negative 36 kilojoules. All right, it's a little different problem. Take a look on 566 at 1512. Uh, what's different about uh, this one is that you are given structural formulas for the reactants and products. So probably should have started with this because this is a little bit easier. We actually can see uh, what bonds there are and how many they are. And we're going to apply the same principle. We're going to add up the bond energies of the reactants. And from that, subtract the bond energy of the products in that order, reactants minus products. So for this particular reaction, we get a delta H of negative 116 kilojoules per mole. All right, let's try one like that. Page 597, number 51. Go ahead and pause the video. All right, in the reactants, we have 10 CH bonds. We have four CC single bonds and 13 halves OO double bonds. Add all of that up. Products, eight CO double bonds. So we have four carbon dioxide molecules. So eight CO double bonds. Five water molecules, so that's 10 HO bonds. Add that up and we get a delta H of negative 407 kilojoules per mole. All right, I think we are going, yeah, go ahead and do uh, number 53, uh, A and B. So same idea, we're doing heats of formation, so we need to be thinking about the equations for the formation of each of those substances. Uh, use bond energies to calculate delta H and then compare uh, with the heats of formation in the back of the book. Let's go ahead and pause the video and do that now. All right, here's our equations. Here's the number of bonds we have in the reactants. So here's the reactants, and then here's the products for both of them. Uh, for the first one, we get negative 241 kilojoules per mole, which is really close to the value for uh, gaseous water in the back of the book, negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole. And then for letter C, we have formation of ozone from elemental oxygen. So we have, uh, what, one and a half moles of OO double bonds in the reactants. And then uh, Lewis structure for ozone, we have one double bond between oxygens and one single bond. Uh, value we get here, 103. Uh, value, value in the back of the book is, I believe, 143, isn't it? 143 uh, kilojoules per mole. So it's quite different. Uh, possibly because of the effect of uh, resonance. So uh, do we really have one double bond and one single bond? We've talked about this before, not really. So uh, that would be my guess for the difference uh, between using bond energies and the actual heat of formation given in the back of the book.
All right, let's change gears. Let's go to changes in something called internal energy. Internal energy refers to all of the energy contained uh, within a substance. So to calculate the change in internal energy that occurs during some chemical process, we take Q plus W. So delta E is our change in internal energy. Q is the heat absorbed by the system. It has to be that way. And then W is the work, it's called, done on a system. We'll talk in a little bit about work being done by the system versus work being done on a system. So for our sign conventions, it has to be this way. Q is heat absorbed by the system. W, work done on a system. Uh, by definition, uh, work is defined, whoops, work is defined as force times distance. I think I mentioned that before. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. I'll show you how um, chemical systems can uh, do work. All right, take a look on page 567. And so we see an example of a chemical process doing work. Uh, it's not a chemical reaction. You just take uh, some dry ice, uh, let it uh, sublime. It forms into a gas, and it's able to raise that book. So it's applying a force uh, through some distance. So work is being done. Uh, just below that, in the shaded box, you'll see the sign conventions. Uh, when Q is positive, that means that heat is being absorbed by the system from the surrounding. So we have an endothermic process. Q is negative. That means heat is released by the system to the surroundings. So we have exothermic process. When W is positive, that means work is being done on the system by the surroundings. And when W is negative, that means that work is being done by the system on the surroundings. Usually for work being done by a chemical system, we don't use this force times distance. Uh, we use P times delta V. So delta V, of course, change in the volume that occurs uh, during some process. So uh, it says this occurs when there is a change in the moles present. So let me, how, how do we get from P times delta V to this? So let's take a look at what P is. P is force per unit area, so force per, say, decimeter square. And if we take that and multiply it by volume in decimeters cubed, then we get force times distance. Decimeters is a distance, or force times distance, that equals work. So I just wanted to show you um, that P times delta V is the same thing as work. So work is being done either by the system or on the system. If the amount of moles of, and it doesn't say this in here, moles of gases changes during a process. Uh, take a look on page 568. So we have on the left two moles of hydrogen, one mole of oxygen. They combine to produce two moles of water. So the amount of gases is changing. Moles of gaseous substances, in this case, is decreasing. So because the moles of gases is decreasing, so is the volume. Notice the temperature, or sorry, the pressure is held constant. We have one atmosphere, but the volume decreases. So work is being done. So in this case, uh, since the volume is decreasing, work is being done by the surroundings on the system. Um, and we'll take a look at, uh, actually go to the bottom of the page since we're on this topic now, and it shows the difference between compression and expansion. So if the volume of your system decreases, this is called compression, uh, take a look at the sign convention there. We have negative P times delta V. And so the work is, the sign for W um, is going to be, um, will be positive. So negative times P delta V, your delta V 
um, is negative since um, notice it says there delta V is V2 minus V1. So V2, your final volume is smaller than your initial volume. Namely, the volume is decreasing. Then we're going to have a negative there. And so the sign for W is positive. If during the reaction uh, you have an increase in the volume, so V2 is bigger than V1, uh, we say then that work is being done um, by the system on the surroundings, and the sign for W will be uh, negative. So just be careful with that. The sign conventions, uh, work being done by the system involves an increase in volume. Uh, work being done on a system uh, will lead to a decrease in the volume of your system. All right, so here's something, another way that we can look at, uh, look at work. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't get to this uh, slide yet. Uh, work equals, again, negative P times delta V. Uh, if we substitute into the ideal gas law, uh, work equals negative NRT. And tech, oops, negative delta, that should be. Let me uh, fix that right away. There you go. Work equals negative P delta V, or if we substitute, work equals negative delta NRT, where delta N is a change in the number of moles of gases present. So technically, uh, delta N is like that. How many moles of gaseous products N2? Maybe we can write it that way. Moles of gaseous products minus moles of gaseous reactants. So if more moles of gas is formed than what you started with, then delta N is positive. If delta N is positive, that means that W is negative. And if W is negative, that means that work is being done by the system. Uh, conversely, if the number of moles of gaseous products is less than moles of gaseous reactants, then your delta N is going to be negative. If delta N is negative, that means that work is positive, and that tells us that work is being done on the system. All right, substituting into the equation from letter B, we get delta E equals Q minus P delta V or Q minus delta NRT. So depending on what information you have, if you have the pressure and the volumes, or if you have the temperature and the amount of the gases, either use P delta V or delta NRT. If delta NRT or work does not change, if no work is being done, and that's usually the case, and we haven't talked about, you know, we haven't thought about work until this, until this point. Uh, if no work is being done, then delta E equals Q. Um, sometimes we write Q as delta H. So delta E equals delta H. All right, let's take a look at an example. So read along with me. For each of the following chemical reactions carried out at constant temperature and constant pressure, predict the sign of W, work, and tell whether work is being done on a system or by the system. So again, if work is being done on the system, the sign for W is positive, and if work is being done by the system, then the sign for W is negative. So we want to look at uh, the moles of gaseous reactants compared to moles of gaseous products. So our first one, we have decomposition of ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate is a solid. We produce a whole bunch of gases. So that means that uh, work is being done by the system because V2 is bigger than V1 or N of the products is greater than N of the reactants in terms of gaseous substances. So that means that um, work is being done by the system, so W is negative. Uh, letter B, we have uh, two moles of gaseous reactants and two moles of gaseous products, so our delta N is zero. Uh, because delta N is zero, that means that no work is being done whatsoever. And lastly, letter C, we have three moles of gaseous reactants, two moles of gaseous products. So at constant temperature, constant pressure, we would see a decrease in the volume of the system. So make sure you understand that. Since the amount of gases is changing during the reaction and the temperature and pressure are not, 
the volume is going to change. So in this case, the volume is going to decrease. We have uh, compression, which means work is being done on a system, on the system, which means that the sign for W is positive. All right, let's go ahead and try one like that, number 77 on page 598. Pause now. So here are our answers in letter A. We're going from a liquid to a gas. So number of gaseous substances is increasing. Volume would increase. That tells us that work is being done uh, by the system on the surroundings. Uh, it doesn't ask for the sign for W, but make sure you know the sign for W. Uh, letter B, we have what two moles of gaseous reactants, one mole of gaseous products. That uh, would lead to a decrease in the total volume, which means that work is being done on the system by the surroundings. And letter C, we have uh, zero moles of gaseous reactants, one, uh, two moles of gaseous products. So this would lead to an increase in the volume of the system, which tells us that work is being done by the system on the surroundings. I uh, mentioned this before, this device, bomb calorimeter, um, also known as a constant volume calorimeter. It's a device that measures uh, the amount of heat released or absorbed by a reaction at constant volume, uh, usually used for heat of combustion or combustion reactions, I should say. Uh, because the volume is not changing, uh, no work is being performed. So in a bomb calorimeter, delta T is equal to Q or delta H. As uh, a diagram or picture of a bomb calorimeter on page 571. So you have a rigid container uh, where the combustion reaction occurs. And then that rigid container is inside another container that's filled with water. And then the energy released by the reaction is absorbed by the water. Um, we'll assume that the calorimeter is a perfect insulator, or maybe it's not. Uh, but energy is released by uh, the reaction absorbed by the water, and you can calculate then the amount of heat released by the reaction. Take a look at example 1514 on the previous page. So we have one gram of ethanol that was burned in a bomb calorimeter. Heat capacity is given to us, so that means that we cannot assume that the bomb calorimeter is a perfect insulator. Temperature of 3,000 grams of water rose from 24.284 degrees Celsius to 26.225 degrees Celsius. Determine delta E for the reaction in joules per gram of ethanol. Usually it's uh, we're finding delta H in kilojoules per mole, but this time we want to, they ask for it in joules per gram. And so pretty similar to what we've done before, we want to calculate the total energy gained by the water using Q equals MCAT and the total energy gained by the calorimeter itself using the heat capacity of the calorimeter and the change in temperature of the calorimeter. And again, since no work is being done, our delta T is equal to Q or delta H. And so if we take a look at the solution there, we get uh, negative 1,365 kilojoules per mole. Not sure why it's given in per mole when it asks for it in uh, joules per gram, but you can very easily, oh, right above that's in joules per kilojoules per gram. So we have negative 29.62 kilojoules per gram or negative 1,365 kilojoules per mole. All right, let's go ahead and try number 67 out, similar to that example problem, and calculates the uh, delta H for the combustion of a substance. And we're going to do that in both kilojoules per gram and kilojoules per mole. Go ahead and pause the video. All right, so I didn't show the work. Hopefully you got that right. So Q equals MCAT for the water. We get 31.3 kilojoules of energy absorbed by the water, uh, 4.40 kilojoules of energy absorbed by the calorimeter itself. So total amount of energy is equal to total, total amount of energy absorbed is equal to total amount of energy released, so 35.7 kilojoules of energy is released. Take that divided by the amount of hydrazine that burned, which was 2 grams, and we get the delta E in kilojoules per gram. Notice to put a negative there because this reaction is exothermic, so same sign convention for delta E as delta H. Technically, this is delta H anyways because no work is being done. And then take that energy total divided by moles of hydrazine, that reacted and we get negative 571 kilojoules per mole. All right, that concludes this lesson. Thanks for watching.